I'm going to talk a little bit about um, this neuroscience acoustic communication, which is a, this is really a collaborative project between uh, me, I'm at Georgia State University, and Professor Mario Pena, who's actually here at the University of Chile. Um, both of us have been interested in acoustic communication in animals for a long time. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about my background and then go into this project as well. So right now I'm in, at uh, Georgia State University, which is right in downtown um, Atlanta. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, um, and I actually have a degree in neuroscience, which a PhD in neuroscience. Neuroscientists approach things in a particular way. What we're interested in are how things work, where in the brain things happen, um, what's sort of the mechanism of thing, either from the molecular or the systems level, where do transitions occur in the brain to go from point A to point B in some sort of process. Um, we're also interested in looking at sort of like simple systems, because the nervous system in the brain is pretty complicated, right? So we're not going to understand the entire brain. We try to look at kind of simple examples of things in order to extract general principles. Um, at the same time, and, and Professor Penn is the same one. Um, at the same time, both of us um, have a background in ethology and animal behavior, and that's sort of a different worldview. In ethology and animal behavior, we're interested in the diversity of things. How do different animals evolve? What are the different capacities that they have? And so these come together in sort of a field called neuroethology, which is to try to understand <coughs> at the level of the brain how these specializations occur in organisms in order to extract general principles about how the way how the brain works. So what I want to do is go from like the very big picture down to the fairly small and narrow project that we're going to talk about here. Um, and the general background is is that um, th that sort of informs a lot of the work that I've done and and, and that's done in neuroethology is that the world is different for different individuals. Um, we kind of know that as a general process for individuals, but you know, at a species level, it's really very different. And so as a, neuroethol as a neuroethologist and neuroscientist, what goes on with that is that somehow the brain makes this happen. Somehow our brain of different individuals or different species varies to a, a degree, either in a fixed way or as a result of experience, that makes the world different for us. Um, ethologists recognize this early on, um, that animals perceive the world differently. And neuroethologists sort of ask this. Uh, neuroscientists often want a clear model to investigate this complex problem. We're, in some ways, we're not very ambitious in this. We don't want to understand how cognition works, how we want to look at a, a very specific thing in order to get uh, an idea about it. And um, this idea actually comes from the ethologists um, far back. And there are a number of ethologists which had amazingly compelling arguments, most of which we've forgotten because we focus on just a couple of things. And one of the ones that I've always been really interested in is, is this person here, Jacob Um He's not, he's a, a very prominent neuroethologist back from uh, in the 19th century up to the early 20th century. He, he's kind of not covered as much anymore as Tim Berg and Lorenz are. But he actually had one of the most interesting, to my view, ideas about this. And, and he came up with this world of the Umfeld. And his idea was that it seemed to have come out of nowhere, as far as I can tell, um, in a world of science where we thought, well, the world is the world, and we all perceive the world, and we make differences about decisions about this. What von Neuxkill said was that the world isn't the world. Well, the world is the world, but our sensory world, our perceptual world is different, and that um, different organisms have a subjective universe, which is very different. Uh, he talked about it on the species level, but what his general idea is, and what has come out philosophically, is that um, we don't actually live in the world. Uh, we live in a world that our brain creates for us. Our brain takes information from the outside world. It creates a model of the world. And we are, in a real world, living in that model, not in the real world. <laughs> and if our sensory systems are different, then our model of the world is different. And the world we are living in is really, really different. And how we react to that world is going to be very different, whether we react cognitively or emotionally. Um, and in fact, at the species level, this is kind of an amazing phenomena. And in the big picture world, different animals have very different sensory systems which produce a world that they live in which is very different from ours, which we can't even really imagine how that works. So electric, uh, electric fish sense electric fields around them. Um, ultraviolet vision, a lot of work has been done on vision. Many fish and many insects see in the ultraviolet uh, world. Uh, magnetic sensing is, seems to be prominent in a number of organisms. They sense the Earth's magnetic field and they use that for migratory processes. And of course, uh, one of the most famous is the infrared sensing in pit vipers, where they have a specialized infrared detection system which somehow gets folded into the visual system. So 
in addition to seeing the world, they have sort of an IR image of the world, which somehow interacts with that. It's really kind of interesting. At the species level, we can see this, but even at the um, level of different groups within a species, this occurs as well. So as we start drilling down there, either as a result of fixed differences or contextual differences or acquired differences, um, animals um, of these different classes respond to social signals differently. Um, and um, for example, in dominant subordinate animals, here we see two female hyenas, which have a dominant hierarchy. There's a dominant female, there's a subordinate female. You can kind of look at the expressions on their face and you know that whatever they're reacting to, these animals are reacting very differently in this social situation here. Males and females in many species, they look different, their, physiolo their physiology is different, and they respond to the same signals in different ways here. So in these sage grouse over here, these are the males and these are the females. I mean, they don't even look like the same species. Um, this male is displaying here, and, and this one's not all that happy about seeing this display. But these females here are you know, kind of interested in what's going on there. So the same signal is coming in, but the responses are, are very different. And here are the animals that we're going to look at, not that particular species, but they're frogs. And I'll go into this a little bit uh, as well, where males and females respond to these social aggregates here. And as a neuroscientist, what we want to know is where in the brain does the signal response change occur? Okay. Um, and so the specific background here um, is we are interested in using acoustic communication in frogs as kind of a model for looking at this. Um, How does the frog brain process its vocal communication signals? Um, and where do these switches occur so that males and females respond differently, for example? Um, so I, this is just sort of what I'm going to go through, so I'll just sort of go through it. Uh, frog auditory system is actually similar to ours in a lot of ways until we get up to the higher levels. They have two ears. The ears respond in much the same way. They have a brainstem system, which has a neural net system that's very uh, similar to ours. Processing gets more complicated. You go higher up into the brain, just like ours. Um, and the midbrain seems to be a, a key transition point here. So not really sort of this is just what frog brain looks like from the top. This is a drawing here. Information comes in through the ear, just like does from us. Ear on both sides. Goes through a bunch of, of, of brainstem areas here. And there's a large area here in the midbrain, which we also have, where things start to get interesting. You start getting the, the transition between sensation, responding to the world that's out there, and perception. What does that world mean? Um, up here, you get a number of cells here that are very specific, for example, to communication signals, where you don't see them before. And this is a, a key transition area where information from the sensory systems gets transmitted to areas of the brain that actually do something motor behavior, emotional control, uh, physiological regulation. So this is an area we're really interested in because it's where transitions occur. And our question is exactly how does this work here? So <laughs> the basics of frog communication, for those of you who don't know it, I don't know why no one would go back, <laughs> besides me would go back over your piece of communication. Um, these are neotropical frogs here. This is a male, this is a male, this is a female. Um, the uh, males aggregate at night in social sense. This is sort of the average male, the, the average uh, frog. And what I'm going to stress is that there's a lot of diversity in this. And one of, the, one of the places you find a lot of diversity actually is in Chile, in the social organization. So males aggregate at night in these social assemblies called choruses for coming in displays. Um, the males produce a species-specific vocalization, which you can call a mating call or an advertisement call. Um, and um, all the social behavior tends to center around these calls. Um, that's what drives what they do. And the, the males respond vocally to each other. So this is a male that's calling. He's inflated a vocal sac, which acts as like a sound radiator. They're really loud. I don't know if you've ever been in a frog horse. They're really loud. They're really tiny, small frogs. Um, so he's calling here. And here's another male over here. Um, what's going to happen is he's, he's attending to what's going on here. And he's going to start calling back, right? Because one of the things that happens is the female responds to the male call and she bases her mating decisions based on hearing that call. So when a male calls over here, another male wants to call right away. And so they have these aggressive interactions between this. And the female sits up here for a while, listen over here, listen over there, listen over here. She makes a decision about who to mate with. And so it's a very female-driven system, which means there's an enormous pressure on these animals. Um, but one of the interesting things about this is a very asymmetric kind of behavior. In most species, females don't call at all. So they have no vocal behavior at all. Sometimes they have little, little sort of release calls, but they, they make no loud vocalization. Um, and in fact, they're structurally, um, larynx is very different, whereas the males call. But both of the, the males and the females have a similar auditory system. They both respond, but they just respond differently. 
right? And so there are a number of differences here that make these interesting. These are all seasonal behaviors, so they tend to be gated by endocrine states. Uh, where do those act is a very interesting question here. Um, and there are, a number of different, there are a number of differences between males and females. One that we've chosen to look at is this response selectivity. Males and females in frogs and many other species respond to the male calls or other calls around them in a very different way in terms of their selectivity. Females in general, like this frog that we've worked on, this is a neotropical frog from Panama, it's called the Tundra River frog. Um, call variation tends to be more important for females than it does for males in terms of whether they're going to respond or not. Um, so you can do an experiment, and we've done a bunch of experiments, where you present them with a, diff a number of different types of calls, from a very clear, strong, loud, conspecific call, to various degraded calls or odd calls. And what you find out is that females tend to be really responsive to this, right? And, and they tend to pay attention to those variations there. So they'll respond, for example, to a a very clear conspecific call by orienting towards the call and going towards it as though it's a good you know, potential mate. If they start to degrade, they don't want to do anything. They don't have any. Males, on the other hand, in some ways, don't give a crap. They just, they just want to respond to everything. <laughs> so they call back to anything that they do. <coughs> and so for the same um, signals, the male will be much less selective in how he responds. So as a neuroscientist, it's kind of interesting to me, because I want to know how that happens. Like, where does that transition occur? Is it an ear thing? Is it a midbrain thing? Is it a forebrain thing? Does the sensory system somehow change its response properties in males and females so that in some ways the call is, they're perceiving the world differently, right? That somehow things are meaningful for one sex, but they're not for the other sex. Um, and so we did a number of experiments here. And in fact, it, it, we did kind of look and see where that change was. And this is a, an experiment that was done in a number of different labs at the University of Texas while I was there. Um, if you look at, at, at uh, male and female responses to a conspecific call versus a closely related heterospecific call, which is, very, which is different enough that they pay attention, um, these are, uh, the black ones are where the animals responded and the here is where they don't, the number that didn't respond. So the females respond, uh, the males respond to, the, uh, to their own call they also, re all of them also respond to this heterospecific call. The females, on the other hand, they all respond to their conspecific call. They'll respond maybe a little bit to this putazide call, but most of them just don't want anything to do with it. And we can look in the midbrain and find out that's where the shift occurs. That's where responses to the call differs in males and females. In males, the responses in the midbrain, not lower, tend to now all of a sudden become equal. Well, they're equal low, they're, let me put this down, they're equal in lower areas in both sexes. In the midbrain, a switch occurs where they maintain this equal responsive here, but the females now are dropping their responses to the non-specific calls. It's as though that's the point at which perception changes in, in the animals. Um, but not all species show the same behavioral differences. And one of the things that became interesting to me as a collaborative project is work that was done in uh, Dr. Penna's lab and, and his students, looking at um, a Chilean frog called um, Chlorodine methyl, it's a very common frog actually, here, um, where the opposite occurs, where females will respond pretty much equally to their native calls versus a call that is unfamiliar to them, whereas males just don't like the unfamiliar call. They don't want to call back at all, and these are just two measures that they did as well. So here we have an opposite sex <coughs> response to selectivity. In most of the animals that I, all the other animals that I work with, the females are very, very selective. The males, on the other hand, are very unselective. Here we have a reverse of that pattern here, where the females are pretty much unselective about who they're going to attend to, whereas the males are only going to call back to something that's very specific. So as a neuroscientist, what we want to know is, test a general principle. Is it the same place in the brain where this occurs? And if that occurs, do we see the same pattern? So the Fulbright project here was to use the diversity of Chilean species to test these kind of basic ideas about the neural processing of communication signals. We want to know in species with different patterns of sex differences in response to the call, um, in this case, Pleurodema uh, um, where does the switch occur? Um, our idea, our hypothesis is at the same place, right? And that's what we're going to test here. We're going to use a, a, a method called using immediate early gene responses to do this. We're going to focus on the midbrain of the short period of time here, but the uh, advantage of this particular uh, method is you can stay in the entire brain and then go back and look later and see what happens here. 
and then compare the neural responses from fluoridine methyl to the flexolimus postulosus, these animals that have opposite sex ideas. So just a little bit here, um, immediate early gene expression is a method to mark the location of neural activity. Um, immediate early genes are genes which are expressed or they become active um, whenever a cell is active. They're actually found throughout the entire, all cells in the body have them. Um, they um, have this interesting property where, at least in the brain, when a neuron becomes active, immediate early gene expression goes up. And you can measure that by measuring RNA, or you can measure protein. There are well-developed processes for doing this that are actually from cancer research, which is when the brain, if you think about it, the brain doesn't just become all active or, or not, it becomes active to, cer to certain signals. It becomes active in this place versus that place, depending on what the context is. So we can use this method, as a lot of people have, in order to mark out where in the brain, for example, communication signals are, are particularly activating the brain, and it's a quantifiable method so that you can then quantify how much activity there is. Because the more the neuron gets depolarized, the more calcium comes in, the more calcium comes in, the more the, the genes express. Um, and so the basic uh, experiment is actually fairly simple. The question is, does an animal sex influence how the midbrain responds to calls? Uh, and so it's a uh, fairly you know, simple kind of experiment. Uh, we have males and females. We can play them their home call versus a foreign call. Uh, the times we're actually working out now in, in the Penal Lab, brains are removed. We can uh, compare the effects of stimulus and sex by looking at immediate early gene expression in these animals here. And we're going to compare them with Lord Dimethal, which is the uh, Chilean species, and Voicelamus pustulosus, which is a species we worked at a lot in Panama. Um, and compare males and females, because a lot of their behavior is otherwise the same. Um, both, in both species, the males make an advertisement call, the female doesn't, so females mute. Um, both of them respond in the same way. The females respond by orienting and going towards it. The males respond by orienting and calling back. But there is that response selectivity, where in this um, species, the males are much more selective in what they respond to than the females do, where here, the, fem the males are much less selective. And so what we want to do is look at the um, midbrain, look at the amount of immediate early gene expression in these two different categories of stimuli, and ask if our idea is that it's here that the transition occurs, at lower levels we'll see males and females being the same in both species as you go up to the area, there will be a switch occurs there as well. Um, this project is really the foundation for further research into looking at this variation here. One of the points I wanted to make is that um, there's a lot of diversity of uh, amphibians. So there's a lot of diversity here in the native uh, species in Chile. And just as an example here, um, I said that in most species, males and females uh, are very different in whether they can call or not. So many females have reduced firing, so they don't call at all. Uh, right at Dermodarmody, both males and females appear to make some sort of advertisement call. So both of them are calling. How does that actually work in terms of the neural system that regulates that? Um, there's another species uh, where um, they're voiceless frogs. It's neither the males or females seem to call. They're not really voiceless, but they don't seem to have mating calls in the same way. Um, just as another example here, uh, Eusophis here is uh, interesting both physiologically and neurally in that they operate at very low temperatures. They're down in Patagonia. Um, they seem to be perfectly happy calling and, and behaving when it's three, four, five, six degrees Celsius outside, which is pretty cold. And if you think about what an eat trick that is, actually, remember that these are very small cold-blooded animals, right, which means that you can think about how well you would operate if your core body temperature was about 5 degrees centigrade. Well, not very well, but they seem to actually tolerate it very well. So the species diversity really provides a lot of material for understanding the mechanisms and the evolution of vocal communication at multiple levels, from the behavior to the neural systems to the liking levels. And that's what, you know, we're trying to establish here as a sort of like a long-term interaction as we look at this um, diversity in species and test general ideas about the ethology and the neuroscience of these frogs. And we want to thank the Fulbright Foundation and also the University of Chile for making this um, possible. Thank you.